graduate degrees in clinical psychology. I have a PhD. Um, I received that PhD from Capella University, located in Minneapolis, Minnesota. I have a master's degree in guidance and counseling from the University of Wisconsin, and I have my BA in psychology with a minor in sociology. What is healthy caregiving? I think we all have a bill of rights that we can look at. As a caregiver, <clears throat> you're not only just a mentor, you're not only just a volunteer, but I do truly believe that you are a caregiver because you give not only of your time, your talents, your heart, but again, I think it's a call, a specific calling by the grace of God. And um, I just want to go over a little bit of these. I'm hoping you can see this. As a caregiver, I have the right to be respected for the work I choose. I take pride in my work and know that I'm making a difference. I garner appreciation and validation for the care I give others. To receive adequate pay for my job as a professional caregiver. For some we do get paid, for others we don't. To discern my personal boundaries and have others respect my choices. To seek assistance from others if and when it is necessary. And I think that's very, very important piece in this group. To take time off to re-energize myself. Again, I think that is an important piece in, this, in, the, in particular in working with these individuals. To socialize, maintain my interests, and sustain a balance of lifestyle. You give so much of your time and talents into this, you also need to remember that you have a life outside of this passion as well. Making a balance. To my own feelings, including negative emotions such as anger, sadness, and frustration, it's inevitable. You're going to happen. It's going to happen. You're going to get frustrated with those individuals that you do work with and help. I do on a daily basis with some of my clients, I do get frustrated. And it is okay to have those feelings. To express my thoughts and feelings to appropriate people at appropriate times. And that is, that is important, is to make sure that if you have those that you work with, and you have a team of people, to sit down and work with each other. To convey hope to those in my care. I think this is a big message for all of us. Is to make, to make sure that we do provide hope for those. We're looking at people that are traumatized, they're full of shame, some of them are full of guilt, and so to remember that we are the kind of the peacemakers out there that we do provide a lot of hope. And to believe those in my care will prosper in mind, body, and spirit as a result of my caregiving. We may not see it all the time. We may not get that reward on a daily basis, but to know in your heart of hearts that deep down inside you are planting a seed. When we're looking at being a caregiver, sometimes what fills us up is what, what is called compassion fatigue. It's not a disease, it's just a bunch of symptoms that we might feel overwhelmed. Compassion fatigue is a natural consequence of stress. It results from caring and helping traumatized people, or sometimes even animals. The outward signs we experience are displays of stress resulting from giving care to others. Sometimes we just get overwhelmed. Compassion fatigue is the name that has been attached to these symptoms so that we have a way of identifying it. And I think this has been fairly recent. Once identified, we are able to take action to manage the distress and the disorder it is causing. So again, it's not a disease, it's just a compilation of symptoms. And what are some of these symptoms? And, and you as a caregiver, as a mentor, as a volunteer, sometimes we bottle up our emotions. Impulse to rescue anyone in need. Isolation from others. Sometimes we have sadness and apathy. Sometimes we lack of interest in self-care of our own. Reoccurring nightmares and flashbacks within ourselves. Persistent physical ailments. Difficulties concentrating, being mentally tired. Prone to accidents. And these are all just precautions. These are all just some symptoms to think about as you continue to do this work and as you continue to, to want to be, be this passionate individual. And the causes, I think we all are familiar with the causes, but I'll go through some of the lists here. Placing the needs of others before our own. I think we each have that. 
within ourselves that sometimes we might be too busy focusing on others and not really paying attention to our own needs. Unresolved past traumas and pain within ourselves. Lack of healthy professional or personal life coping skills. Giving care to others under stress or with burnout. Lack of personal boundaries and the inability to communicate our needs. Sometimes we want to be the savior and we know we can't. So we have to be very careful about how we do our work with individuals and that is developing our own personal boundaries. Stress versus compassion fatigue. What is the cause of stress? I think a lot of us might fall into this, the inability to say no. Chronic need to prove ourselves to others. The lack of respect and support from management, colleagues, patients, clients. Lack of clear-cut responsibilities and authority. Lack of organizational skills and working against deadlines. All of these, stress versus compassion fatigue, and that definitely builds up. And then we have burnout. The causes of burnout, being seriously stressed, being unable to cope, being underappreciated, and being overworked. And some of the compassion fatigue burnout symptoms that we see are exhaustion and poor health, feelings of helplessness and, and hopelessness. Sometimes we lose our purpose. What is our purpose? What is our sense? What is, is there any passion anymore in this? Withdraw from activities and relationships, and sometimes low morale. And sometimes I'd like to talk about what, what is the difference? How do we remember what is stress and what is burnout? Well, stress is drowning. We're overwhelmed. We just, we can't seem to catch a breath. Burnout is just being dried up. We're done. We're empty. We don't have much more to give. And so I want each and every one of you to be very, very cautious and open-minded about what it is. Am I stressed? Is it too much? Or am I burned out? Am I done? And if either one of them, and you're falling under that category, I want you to reach out and ask for help. And talk to another mentor. Talk to another group member. Talk to a professional. Take, take time off. Take a break. You can always come back. I want to talk about how to cope with the stress and the burnout of being a <coughs> caregiver. Accept that what you do is stressful. The people that we work with on a daily basis, they have a lot of drama. And we're just going to have to learn to appreciate the fact that that's what they have. Remember to share your feelings with a trusted friend, a coworker, a family member. Acknowledge others who are experiencing the same. If you see a friend of yours that is probably struggling, reach out to them. Enhance your communication skills to lessen the feeling of being unheard. Talk about it. Initiate positive action to change in your environment. Do something different. Suggest solutions to others that might be drowning. Care for personal needs. Good nutrition, hygiene, and exercise is a big one. Sometimes we forget to take care of ourselves. Take time away from your stressful situation. Go on a vacation, do a massage, take a walk, a bike ride, walk your dog, and don't forget to allow others to help. So how do we break the compassion fatigue cycle? We understand your basic human needs. Define your window of perception. And we'll talk a little bit more about this. Prepare to heal, challenge, and strengths. And practice healthy caregiving versus the unhealthy. So I'm going to flip through these real quick. What is our basic human needs? To feel safe and secure. To love and be loved and to be valued and validated. And remember, some of the clients that we work with, they might only have one of these. They may not understand what feeling loved is about. But I think each and every one of us in this room pretty much has a good understanding of what our basic human need is. And then down here, down below, 
you could fill in other areas. There's definitely more that we have. So some of you might be thinking, well, what is the window of perception? What does that mean? Well, the window of perception is a framework through which each one of us interprets our own experiences. Your clients, the people that we work with, they have no idea what your life is like because they've never lived it and vice versa. So remember that going into this, that we, we, we also have our own um, frame of reference to, to go by. We all have our different cultural roots, identity, our physical, the world around us, our emotional thoughts and feelings, and our spiritual. Some of our clients don't believe, and that will probably be a big one for them. How to prepare, how preparing to, um, to help challenges and strengths. Um, the challenges ahead for being healthy is the lack of knowledge. Lack of time, lack of support, lack of patience, lack of willpower sometimes, and the lack of necessary coping skills. How to prepare to heal those challenges. Making sure that you have the self-awareness, the self-knowledge and self-acceptance and self-respect, and healthy respect for others. I think in our society, a lot of times, we don't know what respect is, and we don't know how to respect others as individuals, and so that's a big one, I think. I just have five more slides. I'm trying to speed things up here for you guys. So healthy caregiving versus unhealthy. What is healthy? Being healthy in your mind, your body, and your spirit. Having the ability to put ourselves in win-win situations. Healthy caregiving puts us in a place where reaping the benefits, being positive, having life-affirming thoughts. This process allows us the space to experience true compassion for others while not taking on their suffering as our own. And that's a big one, to remember that it's a process, it's about compassion and not taking the suffering on, on, of them on ourselves. Unhealthy is chronic caregiving negates the compassion, loving spirit that allows sustainable healing. We can't do it if we're not healthy within ourselves. We put ourselves in lose-lose situations where everyone ends up hurting. And we have to remember, we have to take care of ourselves before we can truly take care of somebody else. I think, again, I like these little laws that come into play. And I'm not necessarily a political person that's just out there. So take frequent breaks from, it should be from, what you were doing. Learn the word no. Use it whenever necessary. Share the load with others. There is humor in every situation. Find it and laugh. Recognize when you need help and ask for it. Give yourself credit when credit is due, hence, I think we need more of these. Breathe deeply as often as possible, and give others credit when credit is due to others. So as, as we think about working with individuals, there is a way that we can take care of ourselves, and some of the standards of self-care is to acknowledge your own needs and wants. <coughs> Clarify your goals and objectives. What is it about this? What is it about what I do? Make sure that you have your own objectives. Educate yourself about pertinent issues. Substance abuse is huge. Drug abuse is huge. You're not going to know it all, but it's good to have some background information on what you're dealing with. Create a sustainable plan. Maybe stay in it for five years. Take a break and go back. <coughs> Shift from other directedness to self-directedness. Make sure that you have your own abundance and guidance of what it is that you want to get out of it. Don't, don't, don't lose that passion if you don't have to. Shift from issue-driven to mission-driven. Make sure that if this is your passion, that you continue to do it for a reason. There's a purpose for it. Practice the art of confinement. Don't do too much. Do what you think you can do. Because you can't do everything for everybody. 
Find your balance and stay on the course. And last but not least is the eight laws governing self-care is by validating ourselves, we promote acceptance. By validating others, we alleviate ourselves. We elevate ourselves, I'm sorry. By meeting our own mental, physical, and emotional needs, we give care from a place of abundance and not scarcity. By practicing self-goodwill, we manifest it throughout our lives. By honoring past traumas and hurts, we allow others the freedom from the pain that controls us. And by doing the work, we reclaim the personal power that is rightfully ours. By naming and taking ownership of the care issues that limit our growth, we create authenticity. And by managing our self-care, we welcome happiness into our lives. And that's what I can't get my point across the most, is to be able to take care of yourselves and to remember to take those breaks when they're needed, to ask the questions. If you don't know the answer, try and find somebody that can help you. This was very short and to the point, and I'm hoping that if anything, you will take some time out today and to breathe and relax and enjoy the rest of the afternoon. So again, thank you all for what you do and reaching out to those that, that need your help. Thank you.